This morning I'm here with Laura Reynolds and I should say this morning for me, late afternoon for you because we're in very different time zones. Yeah. Uh, thank you for joining me and um, Laura confided in me ahead of time that she does get very nervous speaking publicly and so um, I just want to thank you Laura for, for being brave. Your story is so important. Laura was um, someone who identified as transgender, started testosterone, had both breasts removed, and then at some point realized that that wasn't accurate, that it, was, um, it wasn't healthy. And she has since detransitioned and is now speaking out to try and um, kind of spread the word about how kids can kind of be misinformed about gender identity and hopefully stop kids from medically transitioning. And um, Laura's going to start at the university, her classes soon, and, and is going to be offline for a while. So I wanted to give her this opportunity to share her thoughts before submerging in her studies. Um, hi, thank you, Erin. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Laura, and uh, I've been having some technical difficulties with my computer. So hopefully uh, the connection won't disconnect uh, during um, the interview, but if it does, we'll do our best to piece the pieces together and carry on. Um, so yeah, I, um, I guess a little over nine months ago is when I first started talking publicly about my detransition, but for people who don't already know this, I detransitioned over a decade ago. So um, when I transitioned um, around the turn of the millennium, uh, it was not a uh, social contagion yet. And when I detransitioned, um, the word detransition didn't exist yet. And um, I was really very isolated, but I got through it. And uh, I first started to hear about um, other detransitioners, like I guess about a year ago. And then I decided that I wanted to also talk about what my experiences were and um, and I've been, been doing that. I've made some YouTube videos. I've been on Twitter. Um, and uh, I guess uh, one thing that I wanted to, to talk about, I guess I just watched um, uh, a couple videos that you made, which were an interview with uh, Joey Bright. Um, I think that's the right name. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. And she's and, the one who um, wrote the article. Um, yeah, yeah. And, the, and, you know, I'm so glad that I, I got to watch those interviews with you because they give me so much context and background, you know, that I didn't have. I mean, I read, um, you know, this article that had been um, written by this, this person who to me was a totally anonymous person. And I, I, I thought to myself, wow, you know, I've been really wanting to be able to express clearly why I don't think affirming the idea that there are true trans people is helpful for um, you know, young people who are thinking about transitioning. Um, and uh, I just have felt like I don't really know how to do that. And I've talked about it a little bit on Twitter, a lot of times in replies to things that other people, mostly other detransitioners younger than myself have said, um, but no one has really paid attention. Um, because uh, I'm not getting like hundreds of little, you know, hearts or whatever. So I assume, you know, no one's really paying attention. And uh, I just sort of put it off and thought I'll talk about it in another time. And then this, this article comes out, which addresses that issue, but in a way that um, was sort of inflammatory. And from, from my perspective, I was like, oh man, I wish I could have somehow gotten the platform that this article get to say something a little better thought through and you know who is this person even um you know and um and then i uh i watched your interviews and i realized that they're actually um you know this this elder you know butch uh lesbian who had the experience um uh, of almost going down the path of transitioning. So for them, it really feels very personal, um, you know, um, and uh, I just, I'm, you know, wishing to myself, you know, that they had gotten maybe some feedback or maybe they got feedback and they didn't care. I don't know, but to maybe have edited the article um, in a different way and maybe framed it a little bit differently um, because there were a lot of things in it that, um, I think need to be talked about. I think um, 
And it is interesting because in the interview, um, when she's talking about her experiences with, um, you know, being part of the, you know, lesbian scene, you know, in the Bay Area, and then um, witnessing how that, um, you know, fell apart and, um, you know, ceased to really be, you know, a community. And I think that um, it's interesting because it's, it's sort of filling in the gap. I mean, when I arrived in the Bay Area, um, it was the year uh, 2000. And so what was going on there leading up to when I arrived there, you know, in my late teens and then, you know, getting on testosterone from a, a clinic there, um, you know, it, it's a very interesting piece of history, even if it's anecdotal, what was going on there in the 90s leading up to it. But she unfortunately forgot and kept saying it was the 80s and, you know, and that sort of thing. So, which is okay in an interview, but then I think that mistake was also made in the article. And um, uh, it, it says internet connection is unstable. Do you still have my... I still have you. I think we're my, a little unstable, but so far so me? good. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, and, can you hear everything? Uh-huh. And I'm so glad that you brought that up. This is such a difficult topic to discuss because there are such strong feelings. Yeah. And 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 I yeah. um I feel like there is an it, it that it's really important to have some nuance because as someone who suffered from gender dysphoria, gender identity disorder, whatever you want to call it, it was profound and it had a huge impact on me and it it was fueled with such intensity of feelings that for somebody just to sort of say there is no such thing um, is really dismissive. And I, I tried to talk to Joey somewhat about that um, before she wrote this article, because um, I feel like it's important for us to accept that there are people who have gender dysphoria, that that's an actual diagnosis. Um, but I also agree with her very much so that there are, that if we say that there's such a thing as a true trans, that kids, every, every single kid will be saying, well, I'm the true trans. And so, so what is your sort of nuanced perspective yeah. on that, considering you were sort of- well, my, Maybe my perspective isn't so nuanced. Maybe I just think it is, you know, <laughs> and, and that, that's, I guess that's been one of the reasons why I, I've been reluctant to talk about this, I guess, because um, it's interesting, like, in, uh, you know, I'm not a radical feminist, um, you know, um, and um, my positions on different things are sort of uh, different than any set uh, label for like a, a philosophy um, that seems to be in, in circulation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think that um, gender dysphoria really is like a legitimate, you know, thing in the way that it's framed, um, you know, uh, the way that it's framed by, you know, anyone who's going to be using that label for it. Um, I think that people um, experience um, you know, uh, self-hatred for a variety of different reasons um, that then gets interpreted uh, through that lens once they come in contact with um, the idea that that's an appropriate way of interpreting it. Interesting. You know, um, and so, so yeah, so I, I guess for me, the thing that, that kind of bothered me with the article was it was the, it was the personal realization of that these four people who were being, you know, talked about, and really there's only one of them that I really, um, I mean, I, I, I don't even, it, it was interesting because in the video, Joey Bart specifically doesn't say their names, uh, and, and is specifically talking about one person who actually is someone who you could do a whole expose on, but then the article throws these other three people in who I don't think really belong in the same, um, uh, to be, to be, um, it, it just, it just seemed kind of like, you know, some ad hominem attacks and, you know, um, just everything that, um, uh, and now I'm, I'm forgetting her name, but there's a woman who's a journalist on Twitter who explained, you know, why that that's not how to, to, uh, how to, let me, let me look up her name. That's not how to, I think it um, might have been Helen Boyd. write an article where you're talking about, uh, an issue, you, you don't take people and, and turn them into like figureheads for um, what you're trying to criticize. Um, well, so think, let's see. Well, you're looking I, that up. I just want to comment that um, I think we need a different diagnostic uh, label for what's happening because, like you said, okay, so Helen Joyce. Joyce. Helen Joyce. 
as the woman who, who was writing that, um, that she'd say, you know, as a professional journalist about the ethics of publishing pieces that criticize specific individuals. And um, I think so one and, case, and so I think when, when the inclusion said, of Buck with, Angel kind of made sense because Buck Angel is a public figure. Yeah. And so I think it's actually okay yeah. to um, talk about someone who is an acknowledged public figure. Um, the other yeah. one, well, and, and I guess Blair White is as well. I'm not sure about the other two. I don't have a good sense yeah. of that. Well, no, and I mean, nobody really likes Blair White. I'm no feminist like her because she's not a feminist. She's a conservative. So it was just kind of like this grab bag of stuff. And, you know, I actually have a lot of, um, you know, empathy for, for Scott who got thrown in there because he's suffered, you know, these um, terrible botched um, genital surgeries and is very open about that and, and, and about wanting to um, protect kids. And I just, um, I, I just didn't think that was fair. Um, and then the, the other um, trans woman, I won't even mention her name. She's just one of many trans women who have been, I guess, um, involved in the periphery of, you know, GC Twitter and then, you know, been accused of being a grifter or whatever. And I'm not going to accuse anyone of being a grifter. I mean, I, I feel like a lot of times I see these conflicts where, where people are accusing each other of being grifters. And I mean, I, I'm not in a position where I'm struggling to make ends meet. So I'm not in a position where I have a motivation to try to get people to reimburse me for activism that I'm doing, but I have no problem with people doing that um, with the issue that's, that's with that specific person. I'm not gonna comment on it, but the thing with Buck Angel though, I think he really needs to be, um, uh, a light needs to be thrown on his history. And I felt like Joey Bright did that really um, well, despite mixing up the decades um, in the interview with you, and unfortunately not really so well in the article. Um, and it, of course it wasn't just Buck Angel, um, you know, there were a, a number of, you know, uh, you know, uh, women in the, the lesbian scene who then came out as trans men around the same time. Pat Califia is another one, um, who was active in, you know, the leather scene and, um, who was a writer. And I arrived there and to me, these people were all old. I mean, Buck Angel was like, he must have been older than I am now at that time. Um, you know, uh, he, he, he would have been about 38 or 40 or something, you know, and I was, you know, 17 or whatever. So to me, he's just some, some old fart, you know, like I, I don't care. And, and so to think that young kids today are going to care what he thinks is like a little silly. But that's the problem, though, is, is that, you know, the, the natural tendency of young people, because for them, time moves so much slower. Um, to then discount, you know, older people, that is something that has been sort of weaponized since, I guess, the 50s with the creation of, you know, youth culture. And it's something that I think specifically affects, you know, women, you know, the most um, in that um, no one wants to listen to older women, including younger women, including younger women who think that they're the most radical feminist of all. They're not interested in hearing what older women have to say. I'm kind of like in between where I can like reach them a little bit, but not, not that much. I mean, even me, I mean, I'm old, I'm a mom, you know, there's plenty of reasons people don't want to listen to me. Um, but um, the, the way that, you know, these different insults that are based on generation, like the boomer turfs thing, you know, I, I just, it's so unfortunate because I, I really think that there needs to be this cross-generational, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, community and that people aren't um, cutting themselves off from the wisdom of older people who might not be living through what the younger people are living through, but who've lived through a lot of other things and who once were young. Um, but it's difficult because as, as um, people age, they might start getting forgetful about things. And I, it just is so helpful if somebody is an elder and they want to talk about a period of time that's decades in the past, that someone could sit down with them and try to help them maybe check, you know, when, like, when did these things happen? Are they in the correct order? I mean, I'm a relatively young person and I even have trouble with that. But I mean, I think certainly before publishing, but it's so hard because it used to be publishing was something, you know, you had printing presses and like, you know, before anything went there, you actually had, you know, editors. And now it's like anyone can make anything and it's instant and then it's out there and either it disappears or it becomes like um, uh, immortal. Um, and, and it might be something that you wish you could either take back or at least do a little differently, but it's just out there. It's out there. And, and that's um, where I yeah, really, so I've had, um, I have really mixed feelings about what Joey did because on one hand, I'm, I'm so supportive of her and her message, 
Um, but I yeah. am, I'm so concerned. And this is something that the, you know, that the rad femmes will, um, will not like about me, but I really feel like it's important not to promote hatred and that we have compassion for people who have these mental health issues. And so I was curious based on your experience, because you mentioned self-hatred. And for me, well, I don't, I don't want to like totally like talk over you, but, but you, you, you do not always use people's preferred pronouns, right? I, 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 I go that, back and forth and, and it's because I'm still okay. really grappling. I'm not, and I'm not saying that that's hatred. I was just curious. No, about it's that. still, it's because still. Lots of things get branded hatred or yeah, violence that and aren't. And it's part of it. I was just curious about that. No, and I, I'm fat, I do I'm use fat. preferred pronouns. See, and it's part of it because I, I I've got two people who are talking who make a lot of sense to me. And one of them is mm -hmm. Billy Burley, who went through a full sex change operation and regretted mm -hmm. it. And he has said over and over that you need to have compassion. You should use their preferred pronouns and their preferred names. And then you so, show them love and tolerance and then gently guide them into healing. So that's one yeah. side. And then we have Joey Bright on the other side who says, if you use people's preferred pronouns and their preferred names, you are contributing to the damaging of our children. And I understand, well, I can, I understand that. It can be seen as gaslighting. Right. Um, and yep. I can understand that. But I personally, um, I don't, I really just, I, I don't think it's a good idea to, I mean, if, if what you care the most about is trying to help the most people avoid doing the most damage to themselves, which is what I'm about. I'm actually, I'm not interested in women's space or anything. I mean, I, I see that the gender critical arguments, they make sense. They're things I didn't think about before, but I'm really not invested in that. And when, when it comes down to things um, where, um, I just, I, I don't, I, I mean, I almost, I've been, I've been so frustrated by the total unwillingness of, um, you know, the, the gender critical feminists, um, you know, to, uh, to try to be compassionate with young people who are questioning transition and possibly even detransitioning, but who could, you know, retransition if they get too scared. If, if, if people are not willing to be compassionate with those people, then like, what's the point of what they're even doing? Um, right. And that's know, where I feel like and, uh, kids, um, say, kids I like you say, people, they, it's really, it's about bathrooms. It's about, you know, that, you know, these certain, you know, issues. And I'm not saying that like, they're not allowed to have those things be more important to them. But to me, you know, it's not. And like, I can definitely see the angle of not wanting to like, um, you know, gaslight someone who's mentally ill and make it harder for them to figure things out, you know. Um, but I think there's a big difference between like, you know, using someone's preferred pronouns and um, telling somebody that um, they actually do have the brain of the opposite sex or whatever. And the irony though, is that these gender critical people are increasingly um, accepting that there are true trans. And that's the thing that, that really bothers me because to me, it's like, I'm all about compassion, but um, consistency where it really counts. Like to me, pronouns aren't important. That's not something where I feel like I need, that's where I got to draw the line. No, that's not where I have to draw the line. But this idea that there are people who are born with a brain where it's the brain of the opposite sex um, and or that there are people who um, really are better off medically transitioning um, and, and that, that some combination of those two is this idea of true trans, right? Um, that is something that I think um, completely undermines you know, gender critical um, uh, analysis of anything. The thing is, is that's a label that's come to be very loosely applied. So there's plenty of people who call themselves gender critical or who are perceived that way by others who aren't actually gender critical. Um, and I actually am gender critical. And I, I also, and, but I'm not, I'm not a radical feminist. And, I, and to me, I guess, one of the things that was so appealing to me when I found out about gender critical feminism, which is just recently since I had started talking about my detransition, is it seemed to have the uh, the clarity of the analysis of radical feminism without the segues into um, misandry and um, antinatalism and stuff that to me is actually not a, a clear analysis, but it's kind of like, it seems more like people working through their trauma. 
um, and that's kind one of stuff. Thing that and I have noticed, and I actually you know? just brought up today. But, um, it's one of yeah. these, it's the idea that um, among radical feminists, and again, I don't want to generalize and I don't want to attack anybody because mm -hmm. I feel like we're all on the same side on some level. But there's this, yeah. there's this idea that if, you, if it's a woman who is, who is gender dysphoric, who has, you know, assumed a trans identity, it's because of trauma, it's because of um, mis misogyny, it's because of um, restrictive gender labels or autism or something, that they're the victim. Whereas if you have a man who is um, gender confused, that person is a predator, probably autogynophilic and deserves no compassion. And that's where I see the disconnect is that um, for me, it's important to see that uh, people develop this. First of all, I do think there are predators who are, who are capitalizing on the climate right now and they're, they're causing a mm -hmm. lot of trouble. But, there, but to suggest that any male who is um, gender confused is an autogynophilic um, predator is just really um, undermining compassion. Well, also, and also to, to imply that, that anyone who is autogynophilia is a predator. I mean, that's um, true too. I think that, yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's, it's really that, that gets used almost like they're synonyms. Right. And, and, uh, and that the women really, are victims. The women who are, who are gender yeah. confused are victims. The men are you know, in this other camp and trying to- Perpetrators. And, and I think that that is, a, that is a way of looking at things that is appealing even to a lot of um, young D-trans women who have had very negative experiences with um, trans-identified males when they were, um, you know, trans-identified. And I try to be compassionate, you know, um, uh, but I feel like it's, from my perspective, um, it's really important to not allow that to become um, like the gospel truth, um, you know, um, because the, uh, the harm that's being done to um, males, you know, who, who identify as trans and go through medical transition, um, to me, that's, you know, just as uh, big of a problem as the harm being done to females. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm not a radical feminist. I, I'm, I'm, you know, and, and I, am, I am a feminist, um, but uh, my interest in this specific issue having to do with trans um, stuff and medical transitions specifically of young people is to protect people from having iatrogenic medical harm done to them. And that's everybody. I, you know, I don't care. I don't pick which people, you know, um, are, you know, um, uh, sympathetic, you know, um, and certainly not by, by sex. But um, yeah, the thing with with that and the radical feminism, that's an issue. That's an issue with the gender criticals, supposedly, whatever they are, um, too. Another thing about the, the um, uh, so-called so you know, gender criticals that um, a lot of radical feminists seem to be criticizing a lot is the fact that some people who are considered gender critical will work with supposed you know, conservatives or right wing. To me, that's actually not negative. I, um, and that was actually one of the reasons I want to talk to you, um, because I think there's this, uh, this real mi misperception and like phobia of these various different labels that are used interchangeably, right wing, conservative, Christian, as if that is a, a political, you know, uh, a label, you know, that's a religion, um, you know, and all of these things being sort of conflated um, and um, this idea that anyone who um, would even maybe even talk to, you know, somebody who would, um, you know, fall into those categories is somehow, uh, you know, betraying, you know, the cause, whatever the cause is. And to me, that's just so, you know, not true. Um, and if somebody, you know, doesn't want to, um, you know, talk to conservatives or, or at least doesn't want to work in a project that conservatives are working on, that's obviously their decision. No one should feel you know, pressured to do that, but um, I honestly don't see anyone being pressured to do that. That seems to be kind of a myth, um, you know, but I also think, you know, it, it really, I've had people who I respect a lot, you know, other D-trans women, you know, um, saying things on, on Twitter that like they'll, they'll never want to talk to anyone again, they'll block anyone who talks to a conservative, and I'm like, are they going to block me? I mean, like, are they, you know, and, and, and you know, because, um, you know, and, and the thing is, is that I really am not a conservative. And then th there have been a few um, D-trans women who have been sort of hounded into disappearing because they've said that they're, you know, Christian or they've expressed, you know, various views that are considered as conservative. And 
And I've had situations where I've tried to reach out to them, but then they don't want to hear back from, 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 from me. So I wonder then, you know, um, like, is it possible to not choose sides? Like, am, am I too neutral? You know, so and, everyone's and actually, gonna think that I'm, I'm on the other side. You know. Actually, I've been accused of that, um, I've, especially yeah. gender critical and rad femmes. They want me to like yeah. come down on their side and I am too mushy. And, and some people are really uncomfortable with that. And, and, and yeah. it's because I'm not, I'm not a polar thinker. I, I think in a lot of grays. Yeah. And I wonder if it's because I've had experience with this that, and, and I've, I've had, um, you know, I was brought up in a very liberal household, but I have experience with that, um, wanting to run away from myself. And, and so I'm, I'm very compassionate towards people who are suffering from this. And my goal in this is not to vilify anybody, but to stop children from getting these treatments. That's my goal. Yeah. And so, so wondering um, with your experience, cause you're younger than me and you went through mm -hmm. those treatments, you had liberal parents, you said. So, yeah. so speaking like, since both of our goals is to stop this from happening to kids, can you kind of shed some light on what would have helped you not go through with these um, invasive treatments? Um, well, yeah, that's, that's a good question. And it's actually something that I was thinking about. I want, I'd like to be able to give some kind of useful advice. You know, also, you know, um, I've had, you know, the, um, you know, parents of, you know, teens who are trans identified ask me, you know, what do you say to that? You know, and I, and I honestly, I don't know. I think though, for me, I think the only thing that, that, that might've helped would have been, I mean, it depends on how early you notice that there's a problem. It depends on the kid. Um, I mean, I think in some cases, um, you know, uh, there have been people who have desisted and not gone on to medically transition, but who were planning on it after their parents actually did like take them out to a farm somewhere. And it sounds like really crazy and drastic, but I mean, there are people who are saying this happened and this helped me. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say like, don't do that. But like, to me, that sounds really extreme. And I know for me, I don't think anyone could have talked me out of, you know, believing that I was really male. Um, I, what I think might have helped would have been um, being um, aware of, um, the uh the, the harm that medical transition would actually do to my body and obviously no one is going to experience things exactly the same way but in general um i think most people who transition you know in the long run are going to have serious health problems and that's something that is not really talked about because trans people who develop serious health problems um usually in order to um, protect themselves from being accused of being traitors by the, the trans community who doesn't want anyone to say anything that makes transition look bad, they um, are silent about it and they just suffer in silence. And that's why I think, you know, um, Scott, you know, who talks about, you know, what happened to him with his, his botched general surgery is so brave. And even though he's obviously still has this delusional belief he's a man, you know, I'm not going to I don't think he does though. I actually don't think he, because you know? I've talked to him and again, I'm using his, yeah. her pronouns, whatever. But, but when yeah. I talk to Scott, Scott seems very aware that, um, that the biology of his body is male mm -hmm. and, and actually Buck does too. Buck I mean, has come female. out a couple as female, right? Female. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this gets so complicated. Um, yeah. and that's, but I think you're right. I mean, I think that that's where, that's one of the, the reasons that I think that Scott's voice was important in this, is important in this, is because yeah. um, talking about those, those horrible, horrible complications that happened. And, and I have heard nothing positive. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever heard a case where somebody's gotten phalloplasty without any, any complications. Um, and especially in the long yeah, it's, term. It's a, it's a terrible surgery. I mean, in, in, a, in a world of of unnecessary surgeries, that's like one of the, the, the really bad ones. But, um, you know, again, it's not my experience. So it's not something I'm going to talk a lot about. Although I do think people need to be allowed to talk about things that they didn't directly experience. Um, but the fact that he talks about it, I'm just, I'm very grateful for that. Um, and I don't want him to feel like, you know, he can't talk about that unless he detransitions or something. And, and that's the thing that's sort of difficult because I really, I really don't believe in true, true trans. And I think that it's an idea that um, 
uh, when young people, and I've seen this already happen on, on Twitter now, when young people are, who are already on the road of medically transitioning are considering detransitioning, what are the things that can be roadblocks? And obviously no one is responsible for anyone else, but when we're dealing with young people, if, if, they, if their best interest is really what we have at heart, I think it, it, it pays off to pay attention to what are these things. And what I've seen is, um, I've seen um, you know, young um, women who are considering detransitioning getting um, turned off by um, the idea that um, maybe, uh, you know, what really matters is all of this, you know, um, uh, political stuff, you know, in the gender critical um, circles and, um, but they should continue uh, medically transitioning and not detransition because, you know, it's possible to be gender critical and be a feminist and be a lesbian, but still somehow be true trans and um, be someone who would benefit from continuing to medically transition. So I've seen that happen. People have like an aha moment, but then withdraw back into um, continuing to pursue medical transition because they see that these, um, you know, gender critical people um, are celebrating um, uh, people who are trans identified, but who are, um, you know, cozying up to gender critical ideas and, you know, admitting that they aren't actually the opposite sex or, you know, wh whatever, you know, um, uh, admissions they're making um, that cause them to be so much more celebrated than um, detransitioners. Um, and that's the thing that I really don't understand because I, you know, I detransitioned, um, you know, over a decade ago. When I transitioned, it was, um, you know, uh, it was a, at that time around, um, you know, the turn of the millennium, right when um, the gatekeeping was starting to be relaxed in a few places like San Francisco. But, um, you know, it was way before, you know, the big wave and um, there was still some gatekeeping. Um, I am arguably true trans. And sometimes I get so frustrated seeing this, I almost feel like, you know, if I really want people to listen to me, I should just come out again and say, I'm retransitioning. I'm actually a gay trans man, but I'm very gender critical, you know? <laughs> and, and, and then people would actually listen more. And, and I, listen. I, I think there's this, yeah. there's, this, there's this weird thing where, you know, there's this idea that there's these rational trans people and, and that should be celebrated. In, in contrast to the other trans people who are all insane, whether they're, you know, um, uh, um, uh, M to Fs who, you know, are probably all Buffalo Bill from Sons of the Lambs, or whether they're F to Ms who are, you know, tragic lost little girls who are insane, but they're all crazy. And then there's these rational trans who are the true trans who really were just tragically born in the wrong body and they're bravely having all the surgeries they need to make it right, but they, you know, are feminists and they'll, you know, teach you a thing or two about uh, feminism. And I just think that that's like, really, I'm on the, I'm on the same page with um, the Billy Bright or whatever um, no, her I, name is yeah. um, with that. You know, um, I feel like that is really harmful. Um, but to me, it's not harmful because it's harming, you know, the, the gender critical um, political philosophy, or whatever, it's because I see these young, um, you know, girls who are on testosterone coming in contact with these ideas and when they're thinking about going off it and then deciding they're going to stay on it or they're going to get back on it because you can, you, you don't have to detransition to be gender critical, you know? Right. So I think that that is a real, that's a real problem that um, jo Joey Bright, right? Joey uh -huh. Bright, that identified and, and, and talked about. And the thing is, is that there have been other detransitioners like myself talking about this already and no one's been paying us any attention. And I just think it's unfortunate. It, we we could have broach the subject in a more public way um, if we had gotten the platform to do it. And why haven't we? And I don't, I don't really know. Um, well, and, and I know there's some people- the interesting young, thing, um, you know, is that and, I feel and like there is this don't necessarily want to use their platform. real name, but I'm, I'm older and I'm willing to use my real name. And, yeah. you know, I, I, but, but there is, there right is this sense of platforming but, because I've hmm. been told, you know, because my content is nuanced and I do platform yeah. both sides. Yeah. There are some groups, there are some people who hate me who actively yeah. will not, um, you know, share my videos, who will critique me and criticize me. Um, and, yeah. and so it's almost like in order to get a platform, you have to be on the extreme. You have to be one of these camps. You're not allowed to be somewhere in the middle in order to get that platform. And yet stories like yours are actually very important and need to be heard. And so hopefully you will get a platform because I think, you know, one of the things we talked about before we started recording was the importance of therapy and how, um, you mm -hmm. know, one of the reasons that, 
that my um, transgender identity was managed is because I got mm -hmm. therapy and I wasn't yeah. affirmed. And unfortunately, we live in a climate now where children are not only affirmed, but therapists are, are encouraged to affirm, affirm, teachers are encouraged to affirm, parents are encouraged to affirm. And you were kind of in between where we are. So, so I was when therapists said, no, 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 you're a girl. You can, be a, you can be a tomboy, but you're a girl. You were sort of at that point before we're, we're sort of in this where everybody's affirming everything, it seems like. And yeah. so we're so sort I of- had to go, I had to go out of my way to, um, you know, to uh, get on testosterone. I mean, I, um, you know, my parents did then later, you know, pay for my mastectomy and stuff. But when I went to get on hormones, I wasn't with my parents. I had to actually like basically run away from home and um, was, um, you know, basically homeless in San Francisco because that was a place where I knew that they had relaxed the gatekeeping, you know, um, and I would be able to get on testosterone um, despite the fact that um, in another clinic, I probably would not have, um, you know, been approved um, at well, that it point. It sounds like you recently got an autism diagnosis. Which yeah, is yeah, I did. Amazingly, like I just so, keeps coming up, and so, so yeah. I'm wondering if you had gotten that diagnosis, if that would have helped you understand. No, I don't think it would have. I mean, I had a lot of different psychiatric diagnoses um, as a child. I, I was originally diagnosed with ADHD. Yeah, me and, too. <laughs> um, you know, I was put on a lot of medication, which didn't help me. I went through this whole thing, and um, I honestly feel like all that was was pretty negative. I mean, I'm not saying there isn't therapy that's helpful. I don't think kids should be put on psychiatric medications. Um, you know, the balance of it was that um, for me, my experience with, um, you know, the, the helping profession was not helpful. Well, and, and that's know, interesting because you know, mine, people, when I was a little girl, was but, very helpful. The school psychologist mm -hmm. was very helpful. Later in life, it was a disaster. Yeah. It was like you. I got diagnosis. I got yeah. the alphabet of, I've got, you know, <laughs> like ADHD. Um, well, it's interesting, you know, since I, I, and this is, you know, one of the things, when I, when I, when I went, you know, to, to get on testosterone, I was convinced that if I transitioned, that was going to be the solution for all my mental health problems. And, um, uh, you know, what's interesting is, um, obviously that wasn't true. Transitioning was a mistake. Um, I did a lot of damage to my body. And in the aftermath of the second botch chest surgery, um, you know, I got addicted to opiates and that was this whole other thing. And then I got clean, but you know, since then I haven't been on any medication and I haven't gotten any new diagnoses until the autism one, which I sought out. So I actually would say that um, my mental health improved a lot once I reached a certain age. And I feel like you know, I've read, I've read some things about how some people with high functioning autism, um, it takes them longer to, you know, to, to, to mature, but what they do. And, you know, I've read things that just even for normal people that the brain matures at 25. You know, I also know I had all these life experiences, um, which taught me a lot of lessons. Um, so I don't really know which thing to ascribe it to. It's probably, you know, a combination of all those things, but, um, my mental health has been, you know, um, you know, relatively good, you know, for the last, um, you know, I guess, uh, over, over, uh, well, not over a decade, because when I was first detransitioning, I was on drugs, but it's been, it's been almost, it's been almost a decade since things have been relatively, you know, stable for me, and I'm very, very grateful for that, um, but, but yeah, I, I do think that, um, that the, the, uh, what was I going to try to say? Did, did we talk about the thing with age and generation and women or was that before when we weren't recording? I think it? we did. <laughs> did we record that? I, I hope Yeah, we did. I think we did. Because I, hope I think, we did. yeah, I think well, that we're, yeah. I mean, that's where there, there is this importance of, um, you know, a lot of times it seems like the, when I was younger, there was a definite respect for older people and a sense that you could learn from them. But the kids now, they just seem to, to really hate it, older people. I mean, they're just- I thought that that, that got destroyed like in the 60s though. Maybe. Or maybe it was, a, it, was a, it was stages of destruction in terms of like what percentage of the population was really affected by the- Maybe so. You know, but it's really sad age. because I think that older women especially have so much um, wisdom that we could impart to, yeah. to the girls, especially. Yeah. And that's yeah. part of the problem is that, that they're not hearing our stories and they're important. Yeah. And I also feel yeah. like, you know, 
like you were saying, just platforming someone like you who has such good insights, but also still kind of grappling because it sounds to me like you don't have any clear. I did watch your ROGD parent video, which I would recommend parents see, mm -hmm. because one of the things that you've talked yeah. about is that if parents approach a child who's, who's saying that they're trans and is very critical mm -hmm. of them and, and um, dismissive of, of, their, of their belief system, that that might push mm -hmm. them in the wrong direction. Yeah. And it's sort of, as a yeah, parent, it's I, like you yeah. can't win to lose, like no matter what you do. Yeah. But, but there is sort of this balance between being critical and wanting them not to self-harm versus um, wanting to be mm -hmm. compassionate and try to understand what they're experiencing. I guess, um, I guess what I wanted to, to say, there were a few things that I wanted to cover, I guess in a little more detail. I wanted to talk about the things that I see as roadblocks um, that I guess inadvertently, um, you know, gender critical feminists or radical feminists um, who are some of the only people, and I'm grateful that they're addressing these issues, but are, are maybe inadvertently um, making it less likely that certain people will detransition, um, you know? Um, and obviously it's not, I'm not saying, you know, people need to censor themselves because somebody you know, as being a snowflake, but I mean, really, if, if what you really care about is the kids, then it would be good to at least figure out, you know, where things are going wrong. And I've seen, you know, young people um, for a variety of reasons um, question whether medical transition is something they want to follow through on and then um, deciding that it actually is after it seemed as if they were, they were going to detransition um, or maybe they did even br briefly detransition. And I think um, the, the, the one thing I mentioned was the issue with the, um, the, uh, the idea that um, you could maybe even do more to help the cause if you're a, a gender critical trans person, if you detransition, um, and that there is such a thing as true trans. So if you think you are, you might be, um, you know, um, which is of course, you know, what the, um, the, uh, the trans, you know, um, you know, community believes. And, and so you see, you know, people criticizing um, people for, you um, transitioning but not passing well or not trying to pass well um, or, you know, um, using, um, you know, made up pronouns or saying they're non-binary and, and, and none of this is gender critical. All of this is, that is, uh, that is part of the trans community. It, the trans community has always been, you know, elitist and it's always been about the idea that, um, you know, um, transitioning um, is something that you know, should only be for the people who, um, you know, can, des you know, do it well and who deserve it because they're, they're true trans. And if someone, you know, um, believes they're true trans, but physically doesn't pass or their surgery gets botched like me, well, then they're just collateral damage and they should disappear. You know, I mean, I basically got that message um, uh, when I had my botched surgery. Can you and, talk a little bit um, about that surgery? Because I don't think I've heard much reason, about it. That was one of the reasons why I actually detransitioned because I realized that um, I would be, uh, in a sense, not even welcome um, in the trans community anymore because the fact that I had had a botched surgery um, and uh, wasn't willing to conceal that um, would supposedly make it harder for other people to access transition. So basically, um, you know, they always say that um, other people want you know, trans people to kill themselves, which is ridiculous, but actually trans people want trans people to kill themselves. It was really this feeling of almost like, you know, if, if you had a botched surgery, you know, go hide in a cave for the rest of your life. Because if we you spoke out about it, it would, it would undermine the yeah, trans movement. Yeah, okay. yeah exactly. And, and also for me, I mean, I didn't want, I mean, and I guess for people who don't pass well, you know, they can maybe hang out with other trans people and the idea of a trans community that was starting to form then. Um, I, but for me, that was never my goal with transitioning. You know, I um, did not, you know, and I, we say identify as trans. I did not identify as trans. I believed that I was really male. I believe that I had a male brain. You know, I, I was one of these true trans, you know, believers, true believers. And, um, you know, I just wanted to be, um, you know, a, a gay male and disappear into that world. I didn't want to be surrounded by other, you know, trans people who were, you know, unhappy with their transition, but, you know, didn't feel like they had any other options. 